Michael John Bass is an investigative certified public accountant originally from Johannesburg, South Africa. In 1977, he emigrated to Canada, where he held numerous senior financial positions with both Canadian and American corporations, including Kroll Incorporated, where he was responsible for worldwide financial reporting compliance. With a strong attachment to Israel and being very aware of the growth of anti-Semitism, Michael became involved with Jewish Family Services and fostered young children with his wife, Bridget, from children from troubled Jewish homes helping some to become adopted. Actively involved with researching and documenting foreign funding to U.S. colleges, BDS, and campus anti-Semitism for a decade, Michael has made presentations of his data to the Knesset, to universities, government ministries, and intelligence groups in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. His research was also just recently presented in Washington, D.C. at the U.S. Department of Justice Summit on Anti-Semitism. Many articles have since been published that reflect his critical research on foreign funding. Michael is a board member of End Jew Hatred, the Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation, and a cherished member of our own advisory board at the Gross Family Center. I'm delighted to welcome Michael Bass. Thanks, Lara. Thanks a lot, Lauren. First time my wife has told me I should be shouting up here and not being afraid to shout so people can hear me. Uh, I've been studying anti-Semitism and funding, and specifically funding of anti-Semitism in U.S. campuses, across U.S. campuses for the last 10 years or so, a little less than 10 years. And, okay. Um, one thing I've noticed since I've been doing it, uh, and I'm sure everybody here has noticed and read if they haven't noticed it themselves, there's been a big growth in anti-Semitism worldwide, and in particular, unfortunately, on college campuses. There's also been a change in the focus of anti-Semitism or anti-Semites. Now, Jew hatred is being used as a term that more aptly describes exactly what it is. There weren't six million Semites killed, there were six million Jews murdered. Um, in addition, certain people are denying Israel's existence and denying Israel's attachment or Jewish people's attachment to Israel or to even being Jews. They, they're forwarding the notion now that the real Semites are the Palestinians and the real anti-Semitism is based on what's happening to the Palestinians. Be that as it may. Uh, in 2019, Elon Carr at the Department of Justice Summit on Anti-Semitism said, there's a new anti-Semitism, but it's basically the same as the old anti-Semitism. But very recently, what has happened, and again, I'm sure people will notice this, anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism according to those who are Jew haters. Now, this is just a deflection mechanism. They are still basically aiming their target at Jews, Jews in Israel, Jews in wherever, US, Canada, around the world. But because it's attracting too much attention, the focus which was previously all aimed at Holocaust denial is now being turned to anti-Zionism. We're against anti-Zionism. We're against Zionism. We're against Israel. We're not against Jews. So, and unfortunately, and there's been a tremendous amount of discussion about this after the IRA definition on anti-Semitism came out, including from a number of Jewish scholars who have tried to adjust the IRA definition to soften it. Um, so today what I'm going to do is, um, and again, what I'm focusing on is funding and anti-Semitism on campuses. There's a lot of other anti-Semitism that is taking place. Um, I can't get involved in it. It's, there's too much of it. My aim is to try and give you an understanding of what's happening on campuses, where it's coming from, where the funding is coming from, and what the effects have been. Campuses are a very convenient place for anti-Semitism to take place, because there's a lot of people there constantly, and they, they're easy targets. Um, when kids arrive at school the first beginning of the year, they're attracted by various groups, a lot of them who are anti-Semitic, to join them and join in their, their, their activities that are aimed at Jews. 
Um, it's, it's inevitable that this will happen. They, they're impressionable. They're looking for a cause. They, they are seeing things that they, they take in. They have no reason and no reason to, or no ability to deny it or come up with facts. They haven't been taught the facts yet, a lot of them, so they're buying into what's happening. It's unfortunate. The majority of anti-Semitism on campuses is coming from a number of groups in particular, and again, I'm only talking, I will not go into all the various forms of anti-Semitism and where it's, where it's being seen. There are a number of networks that are existing worldwide and in the US and on campuses, which I'll briefly go through. Um, let me just show you something here, if it plays. This is a common occurrence at campuses. This one was actually pretty moderate compared to what does go on. There's a lot of swearing and yelling and shouting and spitting and name calling and very, no, I should not say very little, no interference from campus or any other kind of authority, which goes against the codes of conduct of all colleges, which basically say that if a hostile environment is created where people are put into a situation where they are threatened or a hostile environment that is against the codes of conduct. Um, universities have turned a blind eye, unfortunately, or the administrations have. To understand what's happening, Jews have been marginalized. Jewish students on campus have been marginalized. They've been abused. They've been targeted. They are forced to see things that are going on where they can't speak out. In fact, generally, they, they are defensive. They're not attacking. They go there to learn, and they're being attacked themselves, whether it's verbally or physically in some cases, which is very unfortunate. Um, there have been many high-profile cases, a couple of them where people have been told, you cannot be on a board. You can't. You, your, your voice is not worth hearing because you're biased. You've got a Jewish background. So we don't want to hear what you have to say. People have been kicked off boards, um, college student boards, for the same reason. Your background denies you the, the right to be here and speak out because you're Jewish. You're a white supremacist Jew. To make it worse, Jews now worldwide, not just on campus, but specifically on campus, are seen as white, colonialists, wealthy, elite, and believe it or not, perpetrators, not victims, Jews, as we've seen. Jews are no longer victims. This is the most ridiculous proposition that's come out of these people. And it's mirrored on campuses. Um, Jews are not only not allowed to be perpetrated, not allowed to be victims, they're not included in groups because they are Jewish, they are left out. Whether it's LGBT having a, a parade, the Jewish groups are left out because, and even though Israel is the only country in the Middle East that does look after those people that, that belong to that group. Money coming in. Let me tell you about it. I have been studying it for close seven, eight, ten years. Uh, all the information I have comes directly from the Department of Education and the reports they put out. This and the numbers I'll show you briefly come from the latest report. They've got a new portal in the Department of Education now. Um, it covers the period 1980 right up to 2020. There's been some improvements. It was brought about because of uh, abuses in reporting. Monies were not being reported by a number of colleges. Um, su subsequent to our appearance at, uh, in DC at the Department of Justice some, uh, Summit on Anti-Semitism, I was able to identify three billion dollars that had not been reported by CADA recipients of funding. That is since they've had a, an inquiry since then, investigations by the Department of Justice and Education to look into the funding. So now we have $31 billion that has been reported, over $31 billion, from foreign sources. Of that, and again, as I say, I'm focusing on what's going on in campuses, we've got $10 billion that's come from OIC nations. For those not familiar with OIC, they're a very strong, influential group that is operating at the United Nations and at the EU, and it comprises all 
Muslim nations, not necessarily Muslim majority nations, but all Muslim Middle East and rest of the world. The reason that they are the ones chosen, not chosen, because they are responsible for funding of Middle East study associations where the bulk of anti-Semitism on college campuses is being seen. So that's the, it's not a specific target of them. They are the target because of what they're doing. CADA has funded over $6 billion, primarily to five or six universities. You'll see here very important ones, Cornell, Georgetown, Northwestern, Texas A&M, Carnegie. For all other colleges, they've given $124 million, which seems like really nothing. But that money goes a long way in, in colleges nowadays where they're very happy to get whatever funding they can. Qatar has to be seen for what they are. They are part of the Gulf states. They, they, they're all involved in the Gulf states now in, in various positioning and changing of allegiances. Saudi Arabia, um, Qatar, they, they were not the best of friends. They're making up now. But Qatar harbors Muslim Brotherhood leaders and extremists in exile. They also harbor Hamas leaders in exile. They also fund Hamas with hundreds of millions of dollars a year. That basically says it all about Qatar. That's all you, it's not all you need to know, but that really underlines the issue with Qatar. They support Hamas. Hamas wants to destroy Israel and all Jews therein. So behind the scenes, they, they may look good on, in, in their public relations, things that they put out, but behind the scenes, they, they're pretty deadly. Foreign funding that comes in has again by a number of commentators been classed as influence funding. And I'll ask anybody here the question, why would you give $10 billion to US universities? Why would anybody from Qatar? It's not an investment. They're not getting a return of 10%. They're not getting a return of any percent and they're not getting their money back. So what are they doing it for? Influence. 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 Sorry? Influence. Future Influence, they, they're influencing, the influence is coming from the leaders. The funding comes from the leaders. The, the, the two billion people that live in these areas don't have anything to do with funding or, or any of the other ideological things that are taking place in these countries. The emirs and the, the kings and the leaders and the, the banking, man, banking people are the ones who are responsible for funding. So the influence they are getting um, is not seen. Um, nobody actually sees it in action unless you're seeing what's going on on campuses. They get something in return for this. So the influence they're getting comes after meetings. They don't suddenly get a check of a billion dollars in the mail. They go to Saudi Arabia. They go to Qatar, to Doha. They meet with the leaders and they have to offer something. They're not getting a billion dollars or a hundred million a year, as in some cases they're getting, without giving something in return. We don't see what it is but it's there and the main thing they're getting is influence. The influence they have is being able to create an environment which is unfortunately favorable to Islamist in ideology and not very favorable towards Jews. This is just a brief look at what the Organization of Islamic Cooperation is. I won't spend more time with them because below them we've got what's actually happening on campuses. These are the number of Jew hatred incidents that have been reported Amcha, if everybody's heard of Amcha, they keep records on everything going on on campuses to do with Jewish students, to do with Jewish colleges, and to do with foreign interference, etc. You can see the numbers are, are massive. And by the way, 4,000, 3,600 incidents, whereas the FBI will always say that most people who are, are subject to attacks of this sort do not report the incidents at all. It's no difference on campuses. If anybody's been on a campus where they've been targeted, they're not that keen to go back the next day and face those people again. Young girls, young boys, they not in, they, a lot of them will change sides, unfortunately, at that point. Rather than stand up against it and be subjected to it, they'll either wither and go back or they will join up. And that has happened in a, in a large, to a large degree. The kinds of things that are happening, there's anti-Semitic expressions. Um, they, they, the Jew, Jewish students, they can hide away, but they don't want, they, they're not there to hide, and I don't think anybody should be hiding. There's a targeting of Jewish students, abusive, physical, and, and, and 
verbal behavior, which is really unacceptable, but does carry on quite a lot. BDS is a major, major source of anti-Semitism or Jew hatred on campuses. The SJP, which is the Students for Justice in Palestine, a group formed to basically be on campus. There are 200, I'll show you now, 200, let's go back to this. There are 200 chapters of SJP on campuses. That's thousands of students who are supporting SJP and SJP is supported by Hamas, Hezbollah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the PFLP. So they, they are not there to be nice people. They are there to be abusive to Jews specifically. And when people say, well, we're actually against Israel, there's not a single student on a Jewish camp, on a, on a US campus who has anything to do with the running of Israel. Not one. There's not a single student that has anything to do with what is Israel's politics are. Not one. And yet, they're the ones who are getting the attention. They're the ones who are getting the abuse when SJP holds one of their many, many campaigns, demonizing Israel, calling these kids baby killers, telling them they're responsible for the killing of children, for the taking of organs, whatever the else they, they're throwing at them now, for every other vile thing that the Jewish state of Israel is being blamed for. These young students, if they had, are there at the time, and I'll give you an example of something that happened this week, or maybe it was last week, whatever. Texas, Maryland, and Tech and University of Chicago all held campaigns denouncing Israel for its medical apartheid. A total lie because Israel has not differentiated between who gets a vaccine and who doesn't. They've been getting it and they've all been getting it in large numbers, one of the highest percentages in the world. They've also been accused of causing medical roadside deaths of women who had to give birth on the side of the road and the children died. The things they think up are just beyond belief, but again, it's all aimed at the students because not one single college has adopted a BDS resolution to divest from Israel, not one. So they're not doing it to Israel, who's not, Israel doesn't care what these students are doing. The administration doesn't care. The focus is the young students on campus. They are the ones who are seeing this and being subjected to it. Here's the amount of money coming in. As I said, there's $10 billion coming in. I'm not sure if you can see this, but it's come in from 2005 when it was a very low number of 200 million. 200 million goes a long, long way in getting influence. Um, and you've seen how it's grown. It's grown exponentially to over a billion dollars coming in in 2019. 2020 is not complete yet, but it's close to a billion dollars. This money is very, very powerful. It also doesn't come with strings attached. It's not for, like a lot of countries like Sweden and Switzerland and Belgium, whatever, they may not be Jew-loving countries, but they give money to US campuses as well. But they are for eye institutes, for new technology, for artificial intelligence, for studies of various kinds. The money coming in from the OIC nations has no such reason for coming in. They are just, it's given as basically as gifts. It's shown as gifts to the universities who use it as they will, excepting in one area, and that is the establishment of chairs of Middle East studies at the campuses. Um, there are a lot of them. They're not all in the same category as the ones that are getting ideological funding, and I'll get into that a little bit more in a second. The number of, there are 57 nations funding from the OIC. The top five have given 90% of all the funding. The top three are the main ones, and those are the ones we focused on. Qatar, Saudi Arabia, UAE. Saudi Arabia established more chairs in Middle East studies than, than any other. They also established thousands of mosques at the same time with some very, very violent imams or violent verbally violent imams. Um, and then Kat, so Kata has given the most money by, by huge margin, but they are focused on certain areas only, whereas Saudi Arabia does cover an extensive area right across the country, and are, they are Wahhabis, and they are more fundamentalist, and 
their, their, their reason for being is, as, as is the Muslim Brotherhood, the creation of a Sharia-governed world, starting with their prize, which is the U.S. And they said this in the, in the early, in the late 60s, 70s and 80s, they came in, the Muslim Brotherhood, and they were actually surprised at how well they were received. The people have been in meetings undercover and made recordings and come back and said, wow, they're really surprised at how easily the American people and public and administrations have accepted them with their known ideologies. So they've carried on doing what they're doing. They've carried on funding. The Muslim Brotherhood exists in a number of ways. And this is the U.S. establishment of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's a, a group called the United States Council of Muslim Organizations, USCMO. They are all connected. They form this huge network of interconnected corporations and people, giving them, again, tremendous power. They come from a group, the OIC, which is all connected. So you have a connection within a connection, which is powerful. They all know each other pretty well. They know who they are. They work together. They come from different countries. They have different religions, basically, but they all work together, unlike the Jews, who are very fractured right now and very divided, which is very sad. These people, they may hate each other in certain ways, but they talk with one voice. When they're in the United Nations and they speak out, one voice. When they're dealing with campus activism, one voice. SJP has 200, 200 chapters. They speak with one play sheet. They don't, nobody goes off and does their own thing. So as a result, their ideologies are very strong. The people, of, uh, they are zealous. Um, they, don't, they personally do not need money. This money is not going to students. They're small, small uh, events are held to raise funds for, for the, the students themselves. But the money is going to colleges. Muslim Brotherhood did support the Nazis during World War II. And there's a bunch of other things on there. You can't read them, and nor can I. They're a bit too small. They supported Al-Qaeda. They supported Hamas. Apart from the college networks that we have mentioned of SJP and Muslim Students Association, again, those are networks within the Muslim Brotherhood network. We have networks of interconnected academia. There's a, the majority of academia are fine. I'm, there are some, and they're again in specific areas, who are anti-Semitic. They may, they may have been there for generations. They may have been students themselves, then academia, and a lot of cases have become directors of these Middle East studies groups. Move on, we'll go into the BDS. I mentioned BDS when they, the SJP regularly holds BDS campaigns to divest from, to call on companies to divest from Israel, to call on administrations to divest from Israel. So while they're doing it, and some of these take place in, in, for days, they've got banners, they, they yell and shout, they've got loud hailers, and they, they, they yell and scream things constantly. A lot of young kids who are maybe new, who are maybe uninformed, and a lot of them are uninformed, most, I would say, are uninformed about what's going on because they're only hearing one side of the story. They get taken in by this. They say, wow, these Jews, these Israelis, whatever they're calling them now, these Zionists, sorry, they're Zionists in him now. They're trying to deflect completely. They are taken in by it and they become, they are sold on it. They, a lot of them join up. So when you see a video like I showed in the beginning where tremendous amounts of abuse are screamed and hurled at Jewish speakers, Israeli speakers, or any panel group that includes those, it's not just Palestinian people. It's not just people from Iraq or Iran. There's a lot of young Jewish, sometimes white American students there. Um, they're doing their job, these people. They're bringing in the, the ones who they need. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. That's their call. It's very clearly stated that that means no more Jews in Israel, which they call Palestine. And they are going further now by not even allowing Jews to be called Jews anymore. In their, their opinion, Jews don't exist. The Jews don't belong. They are Western Europeans who just were placed there to take away the land from Palestinians. That's their unfortunate message that's going out. So where's the money going? The Middle East Study Centers have got group, a group called the National Resource Centers. They are specifically designed under Title VI of the Higher Education Act 
to teach a subject of a language, a specific language, and the society and the values and the, everything to do with the people living in that area who use that language. That's what's stipulated. A lot of these get money under this Title VI. A lot of colleges get money, 200, 300,000 a year. And believe it or not, even 300,000 a year is very, very important to them. It's that, that particular study center is very happy to receive 300,000 a year. But their activities, for the, for the most part, there, there, there may be 500 of them across 500 campuses, but the top campuses, the elites, the Ivy Leagues, as you'll see shortly, are abusing the privileges. They are spending 70 to 80 percent of their time bringing in violent anti-Semitic speakers. It has not, it's not even part of what they do. They're supposed to be educating on what's going on in those areas. They're not there to be attacking Israel. They're there to be talking about Israel because they're supposed to be picking on certain countries and explaining the society, the nature, the language, etc. So they, they are breaking the law. They become breeding grounds for Jew hatred, unfortunately. And what is happening is as the funding comes into a campus for, to establish a chair, they say, who they, the people who are providing the funding, usually Saudi Arabia initially, will say, we want so-and-so to be the head of this source, this center. That person generally, almost entirely, in fact, will bring in his own academia under him and they always will be of the same ideology. Otherwise, they're not getting a position and they're not getting tenure. They have violated, they have actually violated the law. They've been called on it a couple of times, if not once yet. And we're talking about hundreds of events that have been held in these centers across the US over the last number of years. Hundreds, hundreds of abuses. There have been two areas twice, once in San Francisco University where Lila Khaled was being brought in, a hijacker to talk. The Jewish pop population and public spoke out and Zoom refused to hold the event, to put the event on. Otherwise, it would have gone ahead. San Francisco State University did not cancel her. Another one was unfortunately Duke Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where they had an anti-Semitic rapper come in and all he did is spew Jew hatred. They were forced to apologize. That's it. They've been told, these people and these groups, that if you don't adhere to the rules, you will lose your funding. So far, none of them have lost their funding. Of the colleges that have got these MISA departments, $7.5 billion has come into them. So that is the influence, and this is the area where the majority of anti-Semitism is taking place. To give you an example of what else is happening there, academia, in these colleges, 2,185 of them have signed boycotts against Israel, academic and cultural boycotts. If you had to read the wording of these, you would have thought Lex Luthor might have come up with the wording. They are so evil. The things they've accused Israel of doing are beyond, just beyond, the, it's impossible to, to explain them without seeing them. The boycotts are pages long, pages, and they are all coming, they all come the same way. Every time there's one of these boycotts and the, the people running them put, put out all the, the brochures, everything is a mirror image to every college that's seeing them. 2,185 have signed officially. As always, there are a large number of academia who don't want their name to be on a thing like this, whether they believe in it or not. So the numbers are possibly 10 times higher. It's, it's hard to know. The fact is 2,185 boy academia endorsing these bo endorsing boycotts is pretty, pretty scary when you think of the, the young people who are learning under them. The funding again has come in uh, pretty regularly since 2005 where it was 100 million up to six, seven, eight hundred million a year into these colleges. They're not getting it back. They're putting it in there because they're getting influence. And not only that, but what I didn't really mention is that what we are seeing now is a 40-year accumulation of funding, a 40-year accumulation of influence, a 40-year accumulation of indoctrination, of ideology, ideological indoctrination. It's carried on year after year after year. The academia move. They, they, they know each other. They'll be at UC Berkeley. They'll be at 
you, Columbia, some of them will be at San Francisco. They move around, they know each other, they bring each other in for their meet, for their various seminars and, and panel thing, events that they have. So that they work as another very strong network in a network of, that covers the colleges right across the country. They're a network within network within network within network. Powerful, they're really powerful and they're really coordinated, consolidated and aggressive. You may not be able to see these, but these are the colleges that got the most funding. Cornell, one and a half billion. Georgetown, 726 million. Carnegie Mellon, 673 million. Northwestern, 576 million. On and on, Harvard, 273 million. These are amounts they've reported. Um, as we found out recently over the last year or so, colleges were not reporting what they should have. Um, I had specifically looked at Harvard and Yale as two colleges who never gave donor names, which again was very suspicious because out of the $30 billion that came in, which is thousands and thousands and thousands of, of gifts and donations, most colleges reported the donor names. <laughs> I'll, I'll be able to talk later. I can't hear you, sorry. I'm a member of Yale, and they just accepted and announced that they took $26 million from Saudi Arabia to build the Islam an Islamic center devoted to studying Islam. That's Yale. Yale. Yes, oh, it's ongoing all the time. Now, I do know that Yale did visit Saudi Arabia, um, on, and they go on a mission to, to get money. They got, Yale got $10 million and it was given on 9-11-2015, which is an interesting date from a, a Saudi banker to establish one of the Yale Institutes, a law institute. So these, these are huge amounts of funding. The countries that are mainly responsible for the funding are Saudi Arabia, 1.8 billion, Qatar, 4.2 billion, and UAE, a billion dollars. It's, they repeat all the time, and they, they are getting what they wanted. The big question always is why? Why are they doing this? They're doing it to get influence. The influence brings in the academia. The academia, especially the director, then appoints his friends, associates, and people who think the same as him, who promote pro-Islamist thinking and ideology. You know, the recipe is there, and they follow it religiously from year to year, college to college, and a lot of these people have moved to different colleges and they do know each other and they, they, they work together. When you look at where the money has gone specifically, and these are some examples here of where big amounts of money came in to endow chairs in Middle East studies. Harvard and Georgetown got 20 million from Al-Walid who basically gave his whole $32 billion fortune to, to provide for this sort of funding. Yale got the 10 million, Arkansas, Berkeley, Cornell, Princeton, Rutgers, Texas, and these are not, definitely not all. This is a small sample of the colleges that receive funding to, to, to set up an actual chair. And this is not all they received. They didn't just get 20 million. They were getting, as you saw previously, they're getting hundreds of million over the period of time. Colleges also, and I have, can't let this one go without mentioning it, Saudi Arabia, spends apparently close to four billion a year funding international endeavors of which close to two billion is coming into u.s campuses to pay for the studies to pay for the tuition for their, they have maybe 50 to 60 to 70 the number changes thousand students at any one time from saudi arabia at about 30 40 thousand a year that's paid directly from by saudi arabia to the colleges who are overjoyed, obviously, to get this kind of funding, especially when things are the way they've been recently and funding is hard, hard to come by. A lot of people have been home, homeschooling, not sure if they're going to go back to colleges anyway. These, now, this is a very indicative of what is happening schedule. You, every name here is a major, elite, high-profile college campus, Chicago, Harvard, Georgetown, Columbia, New York, Berkeley, UCLA, UC, USC, Stanford. What you're seeing here is the funding they're getting in millions, you may not be able to see it, as low as 20 million for UCLA, and there's a reason for that, and as high as 
700 million for Georgetown. The Jew hate incidents that have occurred. They're all in the 40s and 50s. Columbia, 139 that have been reported. Jew hate incidents where Jews have actually been, had the courage to step forward, young Jewish students, and report what's happened to them. The academia that have endorsed the boycotts at these colleges are the reason, one of the, certainly one of the main reasons that this has been allowed to happen. On the right-hand column, I've got Students in Justice in Palestine campus chapter. Every one of them has a chapter, and others have got two or three different chapters, just with a slightly different name. They're all working together. They all, again, as I say, have the same playbook. They all work off the same script. The second last column shows you the percentage of Jewish students at these campuses. Here's a point I'd like to make. If all the people who are on campus who are yelling about Israel were really concerned about what was happening in Israel, this would be happening at every single campus as it happened when I was in South Africa and apartheid was a thing. You didn't care who, what kind of students were on campus, but you spoke out against the government. Here we have the majority of what is happening on campuses that's anti-Semitic happening on campuses where there's a large number of Jews. So who's the target here? Is it Israel or is it the Jewish students? Again, as we said at the BDS campuses, the BDS campaigns, they're aiming at Jewish students. They're not aiming at Israel. They're not aiming at the administration. They're aiming at Jewish students. They are the recipients of the hate that is being thrown out, unfortunately. Again, sadly, a lot of them, and I have to mention Jewish Voice for Peace, a total mischaracterization of a name. They work very closely with Students for Justice in Palestine. They've bought into every lie, every fabrication, every slander, every slur, every lie that has been produced against Israel. This group of Jewish students, for some unbelievable reason, has bought into it. Now, I, personally, I don't understand that. They have not looked at both sides. They haven't read to see what the real stories are. They've accepted this and, and joined up with SJP. Another major area of concentration of, of influence are these hubs. At one point when we were in Israel, we were told to look into hubs and see what hubs exist. I've done this only recently, not then. There's hubs in California, 10 colleges. They're very like-minded, very like-minded students, very like-minded academia. A lot of them do know each other and they mix. Um, they also don't need as much funding uh, in those campuses because they are very zealous, very aggressive, in, uh, generally in California, to war and very anti-Semitic, um, whether it's San Francisco, UCLA, Berkeley, Davis, Riverside, they, they, they tend to be very similar. But if you look at the funding here, $4.2 billion has gone into these hubs in funding, and there's been a 1,000 reported Jewish hate incidents. And this is only covering a period of four or five years of incidents and only those that are reported. At the same time, there's half, 428 academia have signed the, the boycotts from these campuses. So th this, this really, these last two schedules really show what's happening, what the funding has done, where it's gone, May, mostly Middle East study associations. There, there are other kinds of anti-Semitism taking place. People have come into there with preconceived ideas from what they maybe from their growing up or what their friends have said, whatever but they get it very much more when they come to the colleges and they met full force with this non-stop barrage of anti-Semitism that's thrown at them. There were some numbers that came out from Amcha again. Amcha are an amazing organization keeping stats and they just keep stats. They don't try to do anything with them. All of these percentages are showing that where a Middle East study association has a director or academia who sign these boycotts, the number of anti-Semitic incidents is dramatically higher than campuses where there are very, where nobody has signed, and there are some of those where none of them have signed, and there are very few cases in some places where, where there are no academia that have signed. There are very few. Where a director has signed academic boycotts, which influences all these people, they tend to be five times higher. They don't mention this one here. Five times higher number of incidents of Jew hatred that are reported. We'll keep re mentioning reported because the numbers are very likely a lot higher. Just before 
I, I close out, I'd like to just mention a few people that are, have been on campuses, are on campuses, and their backgrounds. The money, in, some of these came before the money came, although there was always money coming. At George Washington University, a major DC campus, $187 million. There were 43 hate incidents and 11 endorsers. And who did they have? Anwar Awlaki. An Al-Qaeda leader, who I think has since been assassinated, he, was, he befriended and was actively connected to 9-11 hijackers when he was an imam. He got friendly with them before the hijacking. He was also active in the Muslim Students Association at George Washington University, and he attended San Diego State. So his influence as one person has to be, well, abhorrent when you think of what, what was going on with him. Columbia University, another major, possibly the highest, definitely the highest number of incidents of Jew hatred, 139. 39 Academia endorsed it officially. Rashid Khalidi, very, very well known, who surrounded himself as well with very like-minded Islamists. Just a couple of the things, he supported Yasser Arafat and he was active with the Palestinian Liberation Organization. So he, and he was out there. Noam Chomsky, uh, we'd rather not talk about. He's a supposedly a Jewish gentleman who hates Jews. He attended Yale University, Oxford, and Chicago. He characterized Israel as a racist state. It's an apartheid system in, opera in creation. But he also claims the Israeli army is in possession of awful weapons of mass destruction, some supplied by the US, that's used, that they've used in cities, villages, and refugee camps. He, by the way, has penned numerous. He's a prolific author. So what you're seeing here is a small sample of the kind of thing that he is spewing, and he has written a large number of books. Georgetown University, one of the largest recipients of funding. Georgetown is a, I think it's considered by a lot of people to be the hotbed of anti-Semitism. Esposito definitely is, and he has surrounded himself. They are very outspoken. These are not people who are, who are talking behind somebody's back. They are very outspoken in their Jew hatred. Esposito, he feels that the United States shouldn't have a problem with Islamic law or be involved in or Islamic ac activity and governance. He feels that Hamas is actually quite a nice organization. And he heads an Islamophobia program, and I don't know how many people are aware of the Islamophobia program. Islamophobia, and I, I'm not going to spend much time on this, very little, was actually designed in 1990 by the Institute of Islamic Thought as a deflection me mechanism to deflect attention away from legitimate criticism of Islamic people. And this, was, this has been said by one of its founders who's come out, I haven't got his name now, Muhammad. Uh, forgotten his name, but he has actually said this in writing. It was a disgusting creation to shield them, to cloak their activities. Well, Georgetown has a whole industry promoting this as a defensive mechanism, and it's not. They work together with a group in Canada that I came across in a panel discussion where they broke into the panel discussion, and it's, it's pretty bad that they use this. In fact, they'll use it if they, if they are calling somebody a Jew and, and in a bad way, and they are called out for it, that's when they call the Islamophobia card is pulled out. You can't attack me, that's Islamophobia. I can say what I like. In conclusion, I would just like to say that uh, what's happened here has created an environment, has been created, it's definitely an environment that's been created by influence funding. It's been it's been around for decades, it's getting stronger, and it did allow this, what the funding on these campuses has allowed this hatred to breed, thrive, and to grow. And it's unfortunate that the Jewish students are the sad and, and pathetic recipients of this treatment. Thanks a lot.